O heavenly King, the comforter, the spirit of truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, treasury of good things, and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from our stain and save our souls for good. With the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Brethren in Christ, glory to Jesus Christ. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome back to Catholic Bible Reader, where we talk about the different books of the Bible. Today we have an old friend of mine, Seraphim Hamilton, Orthodox Christian. He runs a some wonderful content online that I recommend to you. Seraphim, how you doing, brother? I'm doing great. How about you? Hey, it's it's great to talk with you and uh, glad to collaborate on this uh, podcast. We're going to be talking about the saga of David, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and this is part of uh, you. So you've been walk, walking through the Old Testament, and yeah. tell us about what you've been working on Bible study wise. Yeah. So a few months ago, uh, my parish priest asked me to lead a Bible study at my church, and I decided I was going to do kind of the narrative of the Old Testament because. Uh, I think most people are really unfamiliar with uh, the Old Testament and its broad narrative structure, but there's really a lot there that you can get out of it. And there's many different ways that you can understand Christ's work more deeply by looking at the Old Testament. So what I've been doing is I've been going chronologically through the story of the Old Testament um, in a fair bit of detail, but uh, with enough of um, uh not enough detail to kind of go through five hours every book. Um, but right now I am in the book of Samuel and I'm looking at the birth of the Israelite monarchy. And not only do I think the, the people in the, in the study are getting a lot out of it, I think I'm getting a lot out of it as I go back to the text in a kind of systematic way and I'm able to ask uh, questions of it that I haven't asked in this way in a number of years. So I'm really excited to get into the book of Samuel um, um, and uh, come to a deeper appreciation of who Christ is as the son of David. Absolutely. Uh, so the tell us about your Patreon, your patreon.com slash cabane. Oh, yeah. So um, these classes are all uploaded uh, to patrons who are at tier uh, three or four. Um, there's other exclusive written and video content for tier two and tier one. Uh, but the Bible studies themselves, if you're not a member of the parish, those are exclusive for people who are signed up at tiers uh, three and four. Excellent. Okay. So you can click the link below to access Seraphim's uh, content. Uh, if you're not familiar with Seraphim's work, Seraph, I think your original name was Cabane, right? That's why Cabane. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and by original, like that name goes back to when I was nine years old. Yeah. So that's <laughs> why I changed. <laughs> it you were owning nothing. Protestants at 14 or something on the internet, right? Yeah, and it has nothing to do, if you look up Cabane, you'll see it has something to do with like a rank of Japanese samurai. I had no idea when I was nine years old. <laughs> that's funny. Like, it, it sounded like Kaboom to me. That's why I, I named it Cabane. But hey, yeah, there right. are some answers. <laughs> Why not? Okay, so and th so this is part of uh, the as, as far as meaning of Catholic goes. This is part of our annual Bible reader, where we read through the entire Bible liturgically, and um, so right now we're in the time after Pentecost, and we just finished. Um, we we just got into Chronicles now, actually. So we're so it's it starts uh, first First Kings, aka First Samuel. Um, so we've gotten through first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. We're into the Paralipomenon, aka Chronicles now, um, which is a very interesting parallel text regarding David in the first place. Uh, the book of the works of the days of the kings of Judah, as they say in the Hebrew. Um, so if you want to join our Bible reading groups, uh, we, as I said, we read through the whole Bible. There is a penance requirement. So you have to offer up more penances as a part of this lay sodality to enter into the Bible reading group. So you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register to join for that. Uh, but Seraphim, so where where do we begin looking at some of the scope where, where David and the establishment of the monarchy fits in the entire history of the Old Testament? Where do you want to begin? So we talk about the uh, coronation of Saul and David as the establishment of the Israelite monarchy. But in a sense, Israel already has a monarchy at the beginning of the book. Because you begin the book of Samuel by looking at the tabernacle. That's where we meet 
Hannah, who becomes the mother of Samuel. She's approaching the tabernacle, but the tabernacle isn't a species unique building that's disconnected from Israel's entire constitution. The tabernacle is the palace of the divine king. And you can actually see that in the way that it's described in the early chapters of Samuel. So almost always throughout the Old Testament, the Mosaic institution of worship is going to be called what I just called it, the tabernacle. But actually a couple of times in these early chapters of Samuel, it's called the temple. And that word for temple is just the same word as palace. If you go to 1 Kings, where it talks about Solomon's construction of his palatial complex, it's the same word, the temple of God, the palace of the king, or you could say the temple of king, the king and the palace of God. There's a close correlation which is established between these two institutions in Israel. And so the monarchy in Israel is fundamentally about the establishment of an institution which is going to bring the people of Israel more intimately into the royal family. So it's crucially important to understand that from the earliest days in Israel's history, there was already the understanding that there was one day going to become a king. Any Israelite who knew the scriptures would understand that because Jacob had said it in Genesis 49, 8 to 12. There would be a seed from the line of Judah who would rule over the nations. Balaam, who despite himself was overcome with the spirit and prophesied of Christ, said in Numbers chapter 24 that there was going to be a king who was going to rise like a star and uh, would rule over the earth. And importantly, that prophecy has all kinds of intertexts with the prophecy of Jacob back in Genesis 49. And so already in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah is praying for the Lord to exalt the horn of his king. So there's an understanding that there is going to be a monarchy in Israel. But the question is, on what terms is that monarchy going to be established? Now, God had said in the book of Deuteronomy and elsewhere, that Israel was allowed to ask for a king when they had possessed the land that God had given to them. And it's important to recognize that at the beginning of the book of Samuel, even though the conquest is several centuries in the past, Israel had never possessed the entirety of the land that God had allotted to them. And in fact, the portions of the land that they did not possess out of disobedience to God, out of fear of the Canaanites, ended up being the very portions of the land which the Philistines would use as a bridgehead, as it were, to launch raids and attacks into the territory of Israel, which is where we are at the beginning of the book of Samuel. They're under a 40-year, at the beginning of a 40-year Philistine oppression. Just by the way, Samson and Samuel are almost exact contemporaries. When you read the end of the stories of Judges, when Samson is active in the land, you got to think in your mind, Samuel is also active in the land at the same time. It's just a different portion of the land. Um, so we begin at the palace of the divine king, and Hannah is praying for a son. She conceives and she has Samuel. And what's important to recognize about the figure of Samuel is that even though Samuel is uh, genealogically the descendant of Elkanah, his father, and Hannah, his mother, He's not raised in his earthly father's house. Samuel is raised in the house of his heavenly father. As soon as he's weaned, he's brought to the tabernacle of God and he's raised up in that house. And if we think of the tabernacle as the palace of God, we also need to recognize that the tabernacle was established in that very event where God says of Israel, I will adopt Israel as my son. You are my firstborn son. It's also his family home. Because in the Exodus, God brings Israel into his family, which is why, by the way, when Israel sins, it dirties up God's house. Well, if God's house is over here and Israel's house is over here, why does their sin dirty up this house? Because they're getting married or they're getting adopted, so it becomes one house. And now, at the beginning of the book of Samuel, we find Samuel is born in a time when the lamp of the tabernacle is about to go out. That's what we're told. It hasn't yet gone out. But Eli's sons are rotten boys. They're sleeping with the nuns at the tabernacle. They're eating the meat, which is consecrated uniquely to God. Uh, and Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, is prophetically called. In the midst of the night, he's sleeping near the Ark of the Covenant. And that's a very important detail of the text. He's sleeping near the Ark of the Covenant, and he's awakened in the middle of the night. And he's told that he that the house of Eli is going to be destroyed, and, he's, and God is going to desolate the sanctuary. Later in biblical history, this event is going to be used as an image of what happens to the Jerusalem temple when Babylon comes up against it and sacks the Jerusalem temple. And what happens here is that Samuel, in being called by the word of God in the middle of the night, experiences a kind of new birth. That's what happens when you're called as a prophet. You become another man. That language is used of King Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And so Samuel awakes and then he opens the doors of the tabernacle in the morning. Samuel's birth was announced at while Eli sat at the door of the tabernacle. The doorway signifies the birth canal in the scriptures. That's a consistent image. Um, and now Samuel opens the doors of the tabernacle. And then the next 
chapter, the Ark of the Covenant goes into exile. And it doesn't come back into Israelite hands for actually 20 years. But what you find when you look through Samuel is that Samuel himself becomes a kind of living Ark of the Covenant. That is why he was prophetically called in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. That's why we're told that. And that's why, even though Israel was not supposed to worship outside the central sanctuary, Samuel is setting up altars all over the land of Israel. Why is he able to do that? Because he is bearing the divine presence in his own body, as it were. We see this image later in the story of Elisha, by the way, where Elisha goes into the house of the Shunammite woman and she sets up a lampstand and bread and things like that. All imagery which goes back to the temple. When the northern kingdom is cut off from the Jerusalem temple, God makes Elisha a kind of personal replacement for the temple. There's all kinds of typology about John the Baptist and Jesus going on here as well. In any case, the important point about Samuel's adoption into sonship is that Israel is near to the presence of God because God makes his home with Israel and Israel is adopted into sonship. So what God needs and what Israel needs is to be renewed in that sonship and they need to grow up to the point where they can exercise dominion as the crown prince. And what we find through the story of Samuel is that there is a spiritual genealogy where Samuel is begotten in the house of God. Samuel gives a new birth to Saul, but he's disinherited. And then Samuel, through the spirit, gives a new birth to David, who has the spirit inside of him. He's anointed with the oil, which signifies the Holy Spirit. And then David becomes the spiritual heir of Samuel and by implication, God, which takes you then to the Davidic covenant, where the center of that covenant is, I will be to him a father father, and he will be to me a son, speaking about the seed of David, who will build a house for my name. That's all intimately connected because building a house for God's name is not just about, you know, building a building where we can go and worship God. This is the bridal chamber or the adoptive house where the people of Israel is going to be brought near to God. And being brought near to God means being brought into his throne room and being given the rights of a crown prince. And so when you get to kind of the coronation of David in the city of Jerusalem in 2 Samuel chapter 6, you find as he processes up to Mount Zion with the Ark of the Covenant. That's the footstool where God's presence rests. He places it on Zion. And there's all kinds of curious things about this era in history. David sits before the Ark of the Covenant. How can you sit in the presence of a king unless you yourself are a king? And what this shows is that David's coronation is more than a political transformation in the life of Israel. This is a spiritual transfiguration in Israel's life, which elevates them into God's throne room and anticipates the coming of Christ, where in the incarnation of the Son of God, we're adopted into divine sonship. That's the central story of David's life. And it's when you understand the story in this context, I think, that all kinds of other details in the book of Samuel really begin to make sense. That, thank you, sir. This is this is fascinating. Um, I, I'm glad that you pointed out First Samuel two ten, the Song of Hannah, which is obviously a typology of the Magnificat of Our Lady. Yeah. When Hannah says, "The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth; He shall give empire to His King, and shall exalt the horn of His Christ." And then later in the same chapter, it's it's the prophecy uh, where the Lord is prophesying, "I will raise up a faithful priest, and he shall walk all the days before My Christ." And that's very interesting because later on, there's the famous passage in First First Samuel 8, 7, where the Lord says to Samuel, they have not rejected thee, but me, that I should not reign over them. Mm -hmm. So do you think that there's there's sort of two, and I mean, it also the, the ending of Judges is also there was no king. Right. Everyone was doing what, what was right in their own eyes. Um, is there sort of two... Uh, two sort of intentions for the monarchy there is a there is a godly intention that was already there from the beginning this is not a, just a concession to their weakness basically that god transforms mm -hmm. uh but there is also this i want a king just a king like the other nations not mm -hmm. the god king i, I think Where's that the, the key phrase in first samuel 8 where israel demands a king is not so much the phrase that they want a king like the nations roundabout because that's actually used in deuteronomy 17 where god says okay. Wait, you, you can have a king like all the nations around about. It's actually, I want a king to fight my battles for me. Because you remember, oh. what, what's the problem here? The problem is they haven't taken all the land. And when, and when they did conquer the land, we need to pay attention to exactly how they conquered the land. This is not a normal war. It's the priests who are leading 
the people in their battle against the Canaanites. This is a liturgical conquest wherein the land is being consecrated to the service of God. And then throughout the book of Judges, the major crisis throughout Judges is the failure of the Levites. So at the end of Judges, you have a number of stories of obscene infidelity on the part of Israel. But it's important to recognize that these stories are not in chronological order. The chronological sequence of Judges goes from Judges 2 to the end of the story of Samson in Judges 16. After that, you can tell they're being dischronologized because Moses' grandson is actually involved. So this is very early in the history of the Judges. And these dischronologized stories consistently involve stories of Levitical infidelity. So we have a Levite who sets up an idol in the uh, in the land of Dan, for example. You have a Levite who abandons his wife to uh, be uh, raped by a new Sodom. The story re repeats yeah. uh, all the, the details of Sodom early in the scriptures. And so the failure is the failure of the Levites. And that is what uh, is meant, I think, by um, in those days there was no king in Israel. Because remember, the tabernacle was the palace of the divine king. Who are the attendants of the tabernacle? Who are the ones who are supposed to make that effective for Israel? It's the tribe of Levi. They're the ones who are consecrated to draw near to the throne of God and extend that throne to the whole boundaries of Israel. But they didn't do that. Now, in 1 Samuel, Israel still hasn't conquered all the land. In 1 Samuel 7, God has just given them a incredible victory. And the very next chapter, after God, without any human king, has given them this extraordinary victory and basically enabled them to exploit that victory to extend the borders of Israel to the original territory promised to them, they say, I want a king to fight all my battles for me. And that is the fundamental problem, that they were meant to crown a king after the land had been conquered, but they want to crown a king to conquer the land. And that creates all kinds of problems down the road in the history of Israel, where the conquest is legitimated through the accomplishment of the king. And um, we see in later in Samuel, God still uses our mistakes for good, right? God, uh, kind of like when he's talking to Moses, he says, okay, you can speak through Aaron for the time being. And then eventually Moses starts speaking directly. Well, God does use David to extend the territory of Israel to the original promise, but that wasn't the way that it was supposed to be. And God will even say to David, I think this is the passage in Chronicles, God will even say to David that he is not the one to build the temple because he's a man of blood. Right. Well, he had to be a man of blood, but there's still something that is not meant to be. And then I would say just one more point about, about 1 Samuel 8. One of the things that I think is... Um, just on the surface of the text, but people miss it. God is not saying kings do this. God is saying the king who will reign over you will do this. Uh, he's talking about the figure who is about to come into Israel's history, which is King Saul. Now, the reason they get that kind of king is because of the nature of the request that they've submitted. They want a king before their time. And by the way, this echoes back in very deep in biblical typology. Uh, what, what was it that Adam did? Adam took the tree of knowledge before the tree of life. Well, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a tree of kingship over the world. So Solomon prays for the wisdom to discern between good and evil. And that means you have the wisdom or the knowledge to exercise dominion over the creation. You can think of the tree of life as that tree which links you to God and the tree of knowledge is the tree which links you to the world. And you're meant to link to God before you link to the world so that God gives life to the world through man. If you do it the other way around, you exalt yourself and then you're going to be humbled rather than the other way around. And that's the same story which was repeated here. So that, that's very interesting what you say about the priesthood leading the battle. Um, and it makes me think of the interplay between the, the priesthood, this the clerical class, the Levitical rituals and the, the monarchy. Because you have Saul who offers the sacrifice uh, out of order and mm -hmm. he takes on himself a, a priestly role. But then later, David wears the linen ephod and he's mm -hmm. sort of taking on sort of a priestly role, too, uh, which is interesting. And then later on in Isaiah 7, the day or the, the year King Uzziah died, it was Isaiah, Isaiah, Uzziah who was struck with leprosy because mm -hmm. he he usurped the priestly rituals. Yeah. Uh, so there seems to be, again, a, um, a a kingly usurpation of priestly duties on the one hand in Saul, but then there is a, a, a clericalization of the monarchy or, or in some sense, a positive mm -hmm. sense of that in David. Yeah, this is a, this is a really kind of complex thread to follow through the whole Bible. And I haven't followed 
uh, it through to my satisfaction yet, but I have some things that I can I can note here. Uh, when Saul is anointed as king in 1 Samuel chapter 9, so Saul goes to the land of Zuf. He's looking for his father's donkeys. And Zuf yeah. is just the ancestor of Samuel. So this is basically Samuel's family property. We were already told in 1 Samuel chapter 7 that Samuel built an altar in his family property. And the reason for that is what I explained earlier, which is that the tabernacle was the family home of God. But the Ark of the Covenant isn't in Israelite hands. The presence of God is with Samuel. So if the Ark, if the tabernacle is the family home of God, and now Samuel is a member of God's family in this special sense, he can build an altar in his hometown. So Saul finds himself there and Samuel is celebrating a sacrificial feast. And when Saul comes, he shows up, Samuel says, hey, we've been waiting for you, puts him at the head of the table. And he says, hey, I've got this special portion of the sacrificial food for you. And he gives him the leg. And the leg, very interestingly, is mentioned in Leviticus 7 as that special portion of the priest, uh, the peace offering, um, which is what is going on here. There's enough clues here to figure out what kind of offering it is. And it's a special portion for the priests. So Saul is being given a priestly portion of the sacrificial animal. Now, why is that the case? What's what's going on here? Well, I don't have a comprehensive answer, but I have some ideas here, which I think are on the right track. Um, one of them has to do with what I said earlier about the way that lineage is followed through the book of Samuel. So Samuel himself is of the lineage of God. God gives him rebirth at the tabernacle. That's God's family home. So Samuel's the son of God. Remember, I said Samuel will adopt Saul and then he'll adopt David. Um, uh, and uh, we also find that Samuel is the replacement of Eli's fallen lineage. So God says he's going to take down the house of, Le of Eli and his sons. That happens in 1 Samuel chapter 4. And then God's going to raise up another lineage in its place. Now, actually, you can follow this thread through the lineage of Samuel, who is this basically a kind of high priestly figure um running through the book and then samuel adopts saul and disinherits him later and then he'll adopt david and i actually think that this has something to do with why david writes psalm 110 the way that he does the lord said to my lord sit at my right hand you are priest forever after the order of melchizedek when did david write that i think the best guess that we have on when david wrote that is um at the davidic covenant because it's in the Davidic covenant where he, God says to him, I will not take my love for you from you as I took it from the house of Saul. And I think that's what David's referring to when he says the Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. And what is God sworn in the Davidic covenant? That he's going to put a son on the throne of Israel who is going to build a house for God's name. So David, in a sense, is the heir of this priestly commission that goes back to the decommissioning of the house of Eli. And thus what you find in the scriptures is that, well, the kings aren't allowed to liturgize properly in the sanctuary. They are the ones who are responsible for building, of course, and then upkeeping the temple, right? So Joash will cleanse the temple. Hezekiah will do liturgical reforms. Josiah does liturgical reform. But David in particular seems to be an elevated case of this. And that is because we're actually in a unique situation in covenant history. So most people think we've got the tabernacle, and then we have the temple. Well, that's true. But here in 2 Samuel 6, what are we talking about? We're neither in the tabernacle of Moses or in the temple of Solomon. We're in what some would call the Davidic tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant is just sitting out on Zion. Yeah. David is sitting before it, sitting before it, not standing, sitting before the Ark of the Covenant. There are Gentiles who are involved in the worship uh, uh, of God in a way that they will not again be involved to that degree until Jesus Christ comes in the New Covenant. Um, there's all kinds of unique things about this era in covenant history. And also, this is the era in which David organizes the Levites into the Levitical choir and orchestra. The first version of the book of Psalms is written. And I would encourage folks to read the Psalms that are attributed to David in this context. Why is yeah. David talking about all the nations? Clap your hands. Well, look at what Gentiles are doing in the, in the book of Samuel. David is talking about going and looking at the beauty of the Lord in this temple. Well, the Ark of the Covenant is just sitting there. It's, it's naked. There's all kinds of curious things going on here. And it's fascinating. Now, some people have argued that Zion and Moriah are different mountains, and definitely this would be placed on Zion. Other people would say, well, Zion can have both meanings. I haven't come to a definitive conclusion on that myself, but I do think that when we see the word Zion, we're definitely looking back to this era in history. And the prophets of Israel consistently link the Messianic age to Zion. I will build up 
the uh, the um, tent of David, uh, uh, says Amos. And Isaiah 2 talks about the nations of the world flowing to God in Zion, which looks back to this era in history where the Gentiles are sharing in this worship. So there is, I think, a sacralization of the monarchy, which in a sense is true kind of generically. It's true universally. All the kings of Israel are responsible for keeping up the temple. But David in particular is, is seems to be a special case. David's house is linked with God's house in a way that is more intimate than the later kings of Israel and Judah. And I'm sure there's an inner logic of that that I haven't cashed out yet. Um, and that's one reason scripture is so exciting. There's an yeah. infinite number of layers here that to follow through. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Psalm 110 because it's such a mystical, this this whole priesthood of Melchizedek. So, so uh uh, fascinating i wanted to bring up a few of the kind of weird things about the saga of david we, and it's funny how and i'm glad you brought this context in seraphim having talked about all these different aspects of the whole story then we come to the chapter 21 of second samuel where it says there was a famine in the days of david for three years successfully david consulted the oracle of the lord and the lord said it is for saul and his bloody house because he slew the gaboanites or the gabaonites and the Gabaonites are this really interesting story because they're Canaanites who come and deceive Joshua in the book of Joshua. They say, oh, we came from a long uh, country far away and we just heard about your great army. Make a treaty with us. So J Joshua swears an oath that they will be allies. And then he later defends them when they get attacked later. But the funny thing is that this is this oath that he swore on false information um, is is swearing to protect Canaanites, even though God had already put all the Canaanites under the anathema. And then later, God, in fact, punishes uh, Saul, who, or he published, punishes David for the sake of Saul, um, because they had broken this oath. And, uh, and then David has to crucify various members of Saul's house to appease the wrath of God. So it's this it seems to be, I, tell me your take on this, Sarah. It seems to, to emphasize the fact that oaths or covenants are so much, they're like more foundational as, as uh, Scott Hahn, biblical scholar points out, um, the Sabbath itself is the word covenant. So God himself creates the world with a covenant. And so when you make a covenant, you make an oath. Yeah. It's so binding that it's, it, it is, you know, earth shattering. What, what are your thoughts on the Gabaonites? Yeah. So when we, when we talk about a covenant in scripture um, and just in general, a covenant is a word that's used to describe a mode of relation, right? And so when you look at biblical covenants, you can almost always frame them. And I would suggest you could probably always frame them in terms of sonship and in terms of marriage. So when uh, Israel is covenanted with God at Sinai, they're adopted at his, as his son. They're also married to him as bride. And both of those sets of language are used throughout, uh, throughout the scripture. And because uh, um, all sonship is an imprint of the eternal son of God, and the eternal son is the eternal word of God, when God creates the world through the word or through the son, he creates the world in this covenantal relation with him. Jeremiah 33 talks about that. He uses covenantal language to talk about God's day-to-day -day sustenance of the creation. So it's a way of talking about the way that God relates to everything in general. And I think it says something significant, as you pointed out, about the importance of our words and our speech and, and, and things like that. Our words really do do, do something when they go out into the world. Now, about the Gibeonites in particular, the story of the Gibeonites in, in Joshua is one of those really strange stories in scripture. And I haven't pieced through exactly what I think of every detail of that. Are they righteous? Are they unrighteous? I don't, I don't quite know that it's an either or thing. I think it's a lot of characters in scripture are kind of like this. Um, but what we do know is that the all of the Canaanite tribes were put under, you said the anathema, the band, the harem is, is, is what it's called in Hebrew. Um, harem uh, is translated often devoted to destruction, sometimes just devoted. So you'll remember at the beginning of Joshua, the conquest, uh, 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 the destruction of Jericho, all of Jericho is devoted to God. That means it's consecrated to God. And remember the priestly center of the book of Joshua. The priesthood is the one who is leading the conquest of Canaan. We should be thinking in terms of Israel's cult when we think about the conquest of Canaan. So everything is devoted to God. That means God owns it all absolutely and exclusively. So that when Achan and his family take uh, the devoted things they have stolen from God. It's as if they go into the Holy of Holies 
and decide that they're going to scrape off some of the gold from the Ark of the Covenant. It is devoted to God to the same degree. Now, if we think about this in terms of the conquest, what does it mean for our body to be devoted entirely to God or consecrated entirely to God? Let's think about this in kind of a theological sense. My body is utterly consecrated to God. In fact, in a sense, everybody's is because everyone owes their existence to God. What happens in the world to come? In the world to come, Christ fills the whole creation with his glory. As it were, he reclaims the body of everyone because he gave it to them. It belongs to him. He determines uh, the purpose for which that energy is going to be used. Now, what if you have utilized your body in a way which is utterly contrary to his will? What does that mean when he reclaims it for himself? It means the destruction of that person, the eternal destruction of that person. I think these are the terms we should be thinking of when we look at the conquest, because in fact, harem language is used in the New Testament for damnation. Um, so let's think in terms of devotion and things like that. Is there another way you could be devoted to God? In fact, there is, and this is what happens to the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites are not actually, in an ultimate sense, exempted from the harem. Instead, they too are devoted to God, which is why they are not just kind of servants for menial labor. They're special servants. They're servants of God's house, of God's tabernacle. And even if they started off as kind of self-interested, nasty people, eventually, by the time of the book of Samuel, they seem to have a genuine zeal for the tabernacle. And it's a fascinating kind of life history here the, 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 of this particular subtribe of the Canaanites. Um, now, since they are under the ban in this sense, they are consecrated to God as a kind of priestly tribe. What does it mean when you lay hands on the Gibeonites? You're not just stealing land from Gibeon, you're stealing consecrated land. You're doing what Achan did. And remember, Achan is uh, is executed with his family because his whole family becomes heir of this property, which is consecrated to God, and thus it has to be reclaimed through their destruction. So let's think about Saul and his sons. Why are Saul's sons hanged? Well, I think that we can probably consider this in terms of the notion of you know stealing. That's why the Gibeonites say there's not going to be land left for us if Saul's uh, a, a destruction goes forward. And then, of course, Saul hands off this property to his descendants. These are his heirs. And so Saul includes them in his sin because that which he's stolen is given to his sons and his sons are now liable for the crime of taking sacred things. And so they are put under that same ban. They are executed as if they were Achan and his family. They've taken from the consecrated things of God. And again, I think we see in terms of a canonical sense uh, of this text, we see the centrality of liturgical and cultic concepts of the book of Samuel. Because again, we are talking here in the story of Gibeon about a specifically cultic and liturgical sin. That's the crime. And that's why Samuel begins at the tabernacle, it ends with David buying a plot of land on which the temple is going to be built. We always have to keep our eyes laser focused on liturgy, which is the central thread of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. There we go. I I, 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 I missed um, that Gibeon was associated with the tabernacle. When, I just looked it up. First Samuel 4, uh, 4, when they get the Ark of the Covenant, the part of the tabernacle is moved from Shiloh to the great high place in Gibeon. Mm -hmm. And um, another another thing on this is that when the Ark comes back, so remember the Ark of the Covenant goes to Philistine territory. The Philistines yeah. take it, it goes into the Temple of Dagon. God then makes war against the, the false gods. Dagon falls on his face. And then the, the Philistines send it back. It comes to a Levitical city. But the Levites make a mess of it. They're just carrying it on a cart. It should be carried on their shoulders. It's on a cart. It's naked before them. It should be covered. And so what happens is a number of people are stricken with plague. And so they say, we don't want to deal with this. And so they send it to Kiriath Jerim. Well, Kiriath Jerim has already been mentioned in scripture. It's in the book of Joshua. It's a Gibeonite city. So okay. the Gibeonites are the ones who are watching over the Ark of the Covenant until yeah. the Israelites are ready to have it back. That's, that's so fascinating that, that I mean, there's so it's like it's like Ruth. I mean, there's so many different um, yeah. Gentiles or the unexpected anti-hero hero story. Uh, yeah. Let me mention one more interesting thing, and that is um, the the comment that comes over in First Kings, a.k.a. Three Kings, 15, five, when it says this, because David had done that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except the matter of Urias the Heathite 
end quote. So obviously this is the story of Bathsheba. Everybody knows, everyone knows the story of Bathsheba. But what's interesting is that the text seems to imply that King David sinned in two other ways. One is in Second Kings, or sorry, Second Samuel, Second Samuel twenty four one, and the anger of the Lord was again kindled against Israel and stirred up David among them, go and number Israel and Judah, and I, I believe in Chronicles it says Satan did it, um, and so and then David is punished for this. And it appears to be, I, it's it's kind of obscure what exactly is the sin here. It seems to be sort of taking pride in one's army or something like that. Uh, but then there's an implication later on in 2 Kings, a.k.a. 4 Kings, 23-22 under the reign of Josiah, when they find the book of the law and then they have the great Passover. And then it says this, quote, Now there was no such a phase... Passover kept from the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and of the kings of Judah, end quote, which basically implies that King David didn't even celebrate the Passover properly. Um, so it's kind of an interesting uh, implication there. So what do you make of uh, the, these these implied other sins of King David? So uh, let me let me first say just on on the census. Um because this kind of ties together with what I was, I was saying previously. If you look at Exodus 25 to 31, God gives instructions for the tabernacle. It's given in exact dimensions. When you have exact information like that, we're talking about sacred things. That's why you find Ezekiel 40 to 48, Zechariah 1 to 2. There are angels measuring out the yeah. temple, right? Uh, numbers begins with exact measurements of the holy people. God is taking a census. Censuses in the scripture have to do with consecration. And consecration has to do with Israel as the priestly nation. So I would suggest that the sin David commits is essentially uh, on the same analogy as uh, what we were just talking about, the taking of sacred things, the taking of consecrated things. There's not the same degree of culpability. It's not committed with the same degree of a high hand, but it's the same kind of sin. Um, so as to, I, I, I think... With some aspects of the question, I just need to kind of digest it and think about it more, particularly with the Passover question. I don't have a, a, a straightforward answer for what I think about that at this point. Um, with the other question, my inclination is to basically think of the sin with Bathsheba as um, David's, so the traditional Christian language is, is mortal sin in, right. in scripture. There are two in scripture, there's an exact parallel to this, by the way. It's called uh, a sin of inadvertency and a sin of a high hand. Sin of a high hand is when you know what you're doing and you, uh, and you do it anyway. Sin of inadvertency is where you're not really thinking about it. It's There's a lesser degree of culpability. So, you know, when David sins with Bathsheba and has Uriah the Hittite, Uriah the Hittite murdered, this is a sin of a high hand. This effectively cuts him off from relation to God. And David's whole throne is based on his being a son of God, i.e. in traditional language, in a state of grace. So David's whole identity is predicated on him living as a son of God. And here he's broken that. David's other sins, I would say, probably fall under a sin of inadvertency or a venial sin. And I think there are actually other examples in scripture as well, which are implied. So one of them would be David, before he actually comes to the throne, is already taking more than one wife. So some people say, oh, that's allowed in the Old Testament. It's not allowed in the New Testament. Actually, I think you go to Leviticus. Uh, I think it's chapter 18. Uh, I think that prohibits polygamy. Absolutely. Um, and you can see that because the language that is used, they don't take um, another woman as a rival to your wife. And some people say it's just talking about a blood sister. Uh, but any two women in the house are going to be considered sisters in legal terms. This would take more time to explain than we really have here. Uh, but the important point is the beginning of Samuel, Elkanah has two wives. Remember, this is how the whole book begins. Yeah. There's a problem in the house because someone has married two wives and it uses the language from Leviticus. We have no indication that Hannah is a blood sister with her rival wife. But that word rival is used here and it's used there. Right, yeah. that, that indicates to me polygamy, It like it's real. It's not like gay marriage. Two men try to get married. They're not married. It's impossible. Polygamy in the Old Testament is real. You really are married to two women, but it's like cutting off your hand. You're not going to grow the hand back because you shouldn't have done it, uh, but you shouldn't have done it. Um, so when David is going around, he's taking multiple wives. He's kind of doing what Jacob did. David is presented in Samuel as a new Jacob. 
because he's this is the rebirth of the nation and Jacob is the forefather of the nation. His name is Israel. Jacob takes uh, four different wives total and the children are distributed among these four different wives. And you can actually trace out not only the family rivalries in Genesis to which wife they're born of, but actually this family rivalry continues through the whole story of Israel. The tribes are rivals to each other because of that at, in Jacob's life, venial sin, you know, it was a venial sin for Jacob and still catastrophes came uh, uh, to Israel later in their history. And so David is taking multiple wives. What do we find in the book of Samuel? Eventually there's a civil war that has to do with crises in David's family house. And I think that is another sin of David, which for him is a venial sin. And, you know, in the context of the time, this is what you do if you are trying to be a wise uh, crown prince. You got to make marriages with, with the different houses if you're going to keep the kingdom at peace. But it wasn't the right thing to do. And it ended up causing more problems than it solved. Absolutely. So I would say that, that that's another venial sin of David. Okay. So my interpretation right now of that is, is kind of mundane that uh, the, the Bathsheba uh, sin is where he's cut off from relation to God. Um, these other sins don't cut him off from relation to God, but they cause issues down the road. I'm sure there's more there, but at this point, I haven't processed all that. Yeah, that's always been my my thought of interpreting First Kings fifteen five because obviously he sinned in other ways, but he seems to be referring to the only mortal sin he ever committed was Bathsheba. So we've got about five more minutes, Seraphim. Thanks so much for your thoughts. I really appreciate it. This has been invigorating in the scriptures. Uh, any final thoughts for us on Saga of David? David's story is the story of Christ because Jesus is who he is because he's the son of David. God, from the very beginning of history, had made a promise that he would adopt the human family into his own family so that man would exercise dominion over creation in the sense that God's divine life would flow into the creation through the human race. And even when man sins, that fundamental purpose is not revoked or abrogated. And what we find in the story of David is God entering into creation. We find God coming to the tabernacle, his bridal chamber in disrepair and still bringing forth a son. And that's what the story of David in the book of Samuel is all about. It is about God bringing forth a son who will build a house for his name. And that is what we find in the person of Jesus Christ, because David wants to build a house for God. And God says, you know what? I'm going to build a house for you. And in the person of Jesus, both of those purposes are fulfilled because in Jesus, a house is built for God in his body and a house is built for David in that same body. And that's the house that Christians are in. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Seraphim. This has been awesome. Uh, you can, you all can go to patreon.com slash Cabane, K-A-B-A-N-E, to get more content from Seraphim. So with that, let's invoke Our Lady over this and ask for wisdom from the Holy Scripture. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.